My name's Eric, I'm with the AWS security team. Neha's with our automated reasoning team, and we're gonna talk about how we've applied some automated reasoning techniques to security problems. So, we all wanna build secure systems, but if we're gonna do that, we, we need a definition of what secure means. And so, let's dive in to what we mean by secure. And there are plenty of bad ways to define secure systems. And if you look at the upper chunk of this slide, none of these are really any good. Uh, eventually, most teams informally wind up with something that can be captured as the wrong things don't happen. Security people stop bad stuff. The problem is, if that's your definition of security, you're gonna start investing in quick rate and wire cutters. Like, the, the, the goal of security is not just to stop bad things from happening, it's to make sure that the right things do happen. It's to enable systems to deliver to customers. And so this is, the, the, these two balanced objectives is, is more or less where I was a couple of years ago. And then something happened. And I, I wound up with something that's more formal, more structured is my definition for a secure system. And how, how did I get here, you ask? I'm, I'm glad you asked, that was a great question. <laughs> I do security for a living. My job is super hard, I'm really good at it, this is as good as it gets, right? I do all of the security things. We threat model, we do penetration testing, we do fuzzing, like we're, we're really good at our jobs, this is it. And then these insane nut jobs showed up and they started spouting off. They're like, we have these magical mathematical techniques and we've never applied them to security problems before, but how hard could security possibly be? I'm sure we can solve your problems using our magical mathematical techniques. Like, we're totally going to do this for you. And it, it sounded insane, but luckily we took a leap of faith uh, Byron was the first uh, member into the automated reasoning team. He quickly brought Neha on board and then a whole bunch of other people. And we took this leap of faith, and I can tell you that they weren't completely right, but they also weren't completely wrong. Let's look at how our thinking has evolved here. So we have a computer. A modern computer is an incredibly complex thing. Layer after layer after layer of software running on hardware that's incredibly complex. But if you're naive or an optimist, you can fool yourself into thinking that you understand this system. At least the slide of this system is pretty simple. Of course, that computer isn't useful. It's not doing anything. The whole point of pretty much any system that we build is to provide service to some set of humans. And so now we've added people to the system. Only the most naive of us could possibly think that we have an understanding of the entire system. And still, the, the diagram here is pretty simple. Maybe we can reason about it, or, or at least an idealized version of this system. But none of us actually builds that system. The business wants features. Customers want us to fix bugs. The CEO just read an article in Wired and has already issued a press release, so you'd better get coding. The nice, simple diagram quickly gets replaced with a more complex one. Your ability to look at the diagram and fool yourself into believing that you can realize about, reason about it is dwindling. And, of course, pretty standard network diagram here. We've got web servers, the web servers connect to the internet, the web servers also connect to backend servers, and we've got a bastion here that allows us to SSH in. And SSH traffic is shown in orange, and one of the security invariants that we wanna maintain in this system is that all SSH traffic from the internet to the backend servers goes through a bastion. It's a pretty straightforward security invariant. In this case, it's easy to check by hand. You can just iterate across each of those links and say, is this SSH, is it going through a bastion? And you, you can get to a happy place. We can just enumerate all of the SSH paths to the backend servers and check that each of them goes through a bastion. But no real system is static. There's gonna be changes to your system over time. Your system's gonna grow, you're gonna add hosts, most of the changes are going to be in line with your intentions. But how sure are you that all of them are in line with your uh, intentions? And we've all encountered this host. I at your company, Joe may have a different name, they may have a different role, but this server always exists. And so maybe they were totally justified in what they did at the time. Maybe the application was on fire and this was the way to put out the fire or you needed to add emergency capacity. Like maybe they were making good decisions at the time, but now our invariant has been broken. Are we sure that we know 
that our invariant has been broken. In this diagram, it's a glaringly obvious exception. It's easy to spot. But if you have a large application and you use one of those automated application discovery tools, you're gonna wind up with something like this. We have this diagram for the Amazon.com retail website. There's www.amazon.com in the middle, and we call it the Death Star diagram because it's a giant black circle that provides absolutely no information to anyone. So, quick, spot the unwanted traffic in this diagram. Bob's desk doesn't stand out anymore. So, networks are just the, the problem we're using to motivate this here. They're not special. Every system that I've ever encountered goes through this kind of evolution on time. So permissions policies, they start out nice and simple and straight, and then over time, you know, well, there's this use case and there's this special exception, and eventually you have this, this monster that's 400,000 lines and no one can reason about it anymore. Inter-process communication, that web server there, it's not just a, a web server process sitting on the network, there's a whole operating system around it and all sorts of other things running on that box, and those things get more complex over time. Your code. Any non-trivial, not brand new code base is an archeological dig. Electrical systems, especially in industrial settings. Uh, electricians are some of the most careful people that I've met, but even so, the as-built diagrams, the blueprints, and the actual building rarely line up exactly. I have a couple of old trucks, uh, and I, I do have a house, just one though. Um, it turns out that all previous owners of such things are terrible people. Like, my electrical panel has all sorts of crossed out things and things scribbled in, and we replace some flooring, and you find something under the flooring, and you're just like, what were they thinking? All systems go through these evolutions over time. And what you have and what you think you have don't necessarily line up. So I, I, I finished telling you this glorious story about how we, we don't know what we have. What, what are we to do as security professionals? How do we make progress here? And a key realization is that all security problems are violated assumptions. The builder of the system, it maybe it was an explicit assumption, maybe it was an unstated assumption, but there's some assumption that's been broken and that's led to the security issue. And so we can try to violate some of our assumptions or we can try and spot our assumptions and remediate them. So penetration testing, time-honored security technique here, if it's 1996 and you're behind on your OWASP top 10, you just lost your user's table in your database. Now, this is a creative act by an evil person. At this point, it's not a creative act because we all know about SQL injection, but the first person to do this looked at the problem space and they came up with something fundamentally new. And hopefully, this evil person that came up with this new creative thing is someone that's in your employ and they handed it to you wrapped up in a nice little present for you to go fix, but still, this is, this is something that you expected to always be true. You expected that you would not have parameters for your SQL uh, statements that violated this, that, that had that semicolon there and injected more SQL. And so it's a violated assumption that was spotted by someone that was thinking creatively. Humans love exploring space, and we are going to explore space, but we're going to explore space that is way less interesting and photogenic. When I talk about a state space, if, if you know what a finite state machine is, that's the, the image that you should have in your hand. So we have a, a simple system, and it's just got two buttons on it. There's increment A and increment B. And so we're gonna have a start state. Execution begins in some state, and the state captures all of the possible variables, all of the data that the system has in that state. And if I call increment A, we move to a new state, and I can keep doing this as many times as I want, and I can call increment B, and I can do that as many times as I want. And every state that the system could possibly be in is captured in this state space. And so here we've got a state, and there are many paths that reach this state. Some, some sequence of interleaved calls of increment A and increment B will get me to this state. But the state space also includes all possible states. And so this state here, B is negative one. If you assume arbitrary position integers, there is no set of increment operations that's gonna get B to equal negative one. This is an unreachable state. And so it's in the state space, it's just not reachable from our chosen starting state. So, maybe you wanna make sure that the number of mathematicians is less than eight. Well, negative three is less than eight, and you're gonna do some math and maybe you, you, you do some point arithmetic and you scribble over something important like a stack frame. 
Do you know what happens when you cast a signed integer to an unsigned integer? It turns into a really, really big number. And so negative three cast to unsigned is way more than eight. Who knows what your code is gonna do now? This is uh, a favorite of pen testers everywhere. The first thing that any pen tester does is fire up a script that pastes something like this into literally every form in every application that they can get a hold of. This is a JavaScript injection attack. If you're not scrubbing JavaScript out of your input, if, if you're not being careful again, OWASP top 10 stuff, you're gonna get a little own pop up. Or, you know, if they're not under your employ, something worse is gonna happen. You didn't expect valid JavaScript in that input field. It's perfectly safe to type it into PowerPoint, but you know, who knows what's gonna happen when you type it into your web application. This last one here, this is Heartbleed. The author of the TLS Heartbeat implementation in Heartbleed never expected that the actual message length and the claimed message length wouldn't line up. This is a trivial bug to exploit. You just have two numbers that don't line up, but their unstated assumption is these two numbers would always be the same. Someone else spotted that assumption, made those two numbers different, and the whole internet got to patch overnight. These are all creative acts. Some of them are old and well known, and they're, they're basically tropes in the security world, but initially it was someone that came up with this, a new creative thought. And there are limits to human creativity. I don't know what other attacks are out there. I don't know what other assumptions as an industry we have. And so this penetration testing, it's great, don't, don't get me wrong, like you should be doing this. It is valuable, but it's never going to exhaust the state space. Fuzzing is another time-honored security technique. I'm a huge fan of fuzzing. We found some really, really interesting bugs using fuzzing. The idea is that most unexpected states lead to crashes. If, if you violate the set of states that should be connected, you're off in the woods and you're probably gonna wind up with a core file. Unexpected input can drive the program into an unexpected state, so let's generate random input and wait for crashes and just continuously drive random input at the process until we get a crash. And if we're smart, you can do some back propagation. You can watch where you're getting to in the code with various inputs and you can dynamically learn because you don't wanna just sit there at the input validation and not really get deep into the code. And so uh, smarter fuzzers do better things. And so this is great. We've got a cloud. We can fire up a whole bunch of instances doing fuzzing against some process. And we're not relying on humans to be clever here. Like the, the, the fuzzer isn't thinking about assumptions. It's just generating random inputs that will eventually violate an assumption. But the state spaces that we're talking about here are immense. And so it doesn't matter how many random fuzzers we have running, we're never gonna exhaust it. Let's go back to that, that networking example. So there, there's a wonderful property of the cloud. There is no dusty corner of the cloud. There is no server under Joe's desk. If it's on the network in your VPC, it came in through the APIs, it's listed in describe instances, like we can find everything. We can, we can enumerate all of the connectivity in the VPC. And this is wonderful. We can listen for changes in the APIs, and the, the, the APIs themselves dictate the design, the implementation, so the network is exactly as it's reflected in the APIs. So I know everything on the network. I can know it again with just a few API calls. Now I have all the data, actual ground truth for the configuration of my network. I can do the analysis and verify that I have the network I want, right? So let's do some quick math. You know, I've got some number of accounts and VPCs and subnets and the subnets have ACLs on them and the ACLs are parallel to security groups and there's routing tables and instances and then to each of those instances, I'm missing the ENI line there, uh, for each of these instances, uh, the network traffic to them can have some protocol and some port and you know, we just go through and we assign reasonable numbers to all of these and then through the magic of computers, we can do the math and we come up with this nine billion number. And you're looking at that 65,000 and saying, but Eric, without the 65,000, this number seems way more tractable. But we're only talking about one endpoint here. Like, we're not talking about the two to the 32 possible source IP addresses. And, you know, maybe we can collapse the 65,000 down a bit, but, you know, ports less than 1,024 behave differently than ports greater than 1,024. If we collapse this down, are we collapsing out meaningful complexity, things that matter to the behavior of our system? And so this is just one node as well. This isn't the interactions between nodes, and these nodes are stateful. They're all running TCP. There's a state transition diagram there for every connection. And so the, the combinatorial explosion here is massive. It's way more than nine billion. 
And so if I were to start actually testing this, if I were to start generating network packets, you know, just a long line of zeros, put it on the network, long line of zeros followed by a one, put it on the network, I would never ever cover a meaningful fraction of the state space just by exhaustive network testing. Even in the cloud, I can't do that. So rather than trying to violate some assumptions, let's try and spot some assumptions. So threat modeling, again, a wonderful exercise. I don't know how many times I've sat down with someone and done the threat modeling exercise and we have found meaningful issues with the design of their system well before it ever went into production. There's many frameworks for threat modeling. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one you do. The important thing is that you take a structured approach. You take a representation of your system. In this case, I'm using Stride. And for every link in your system, you ask the Stride questions. And you're not supposed to shoot from the hip. You're supposed to really think about these and dig into them and understand what the risks are that you face in each of these to develop a more nuanced and deeper understanding of your system. This is great, it's valuable, but it's still done by humans. We've found meaningful issues, but likewise, we've had pen testers come back to us with bugs, and the, the, the owner of the system says, oh, well, that wasn't considered on a threat model. It's because we're modeling the system at some layer of abstraction. There's no line here between the web servers. There's no link there. Is that because they're physically prevented from talking to each other in the network? Or is it because we just didn't expect traffic between them? Is there a mechanism preventing traffic between them? Or do you just hope that people don't send traffic between them? And so this model is not the actual network. It's, it's a layer or more layers removed from it. And so you can have multiple threat models. You can have the big boxology threat model of the entire system and the threat model for this component. That web server itself is a reasonably complex thing. Like how are the processes laid out on it? Have you sandboxed the web server processes? Is running it as an unprivileged user? You can keep going endlessly, but again, with threat modeling, it's very hard to cover the entire state space. And so we've almost got a magic recipe. We want to cover the entire state space. We want to be able to make absolute statements about the behavior of our system. Sending humans in is fun, and I really mean this. Like, if you've not tried pen testing, you should. It's like being an eight-year-old with a baseball bat in a china shop. Like, it is your job to break stuff, and you need to try it out. But it's slow. You're not going to get complete coverage. Fuzzing, great technique, not going to get complete coverage. Modeling your system, though, makes it more tractable. We'd never be able to ask the stride questions about literally every line of code, but by taking it up one or more levels, we do have a threat model that a human being can reasonably complete. And it is a valuable exercise, so modeling is useful. But if you model it too low a level, that's that the combinatoric explosion hits you, and, and you don't ever actually complete the threat model. And if you do it too high up, the threat model is nice and clean and elegant, but you're missing meaningful complexity in your actual applications. And the full state of AWS is captured via APIs. So we've got this ideal place at which to do our modeling. So we've got all of these ingredients. We're so close. There's just one missing ingredient here. And that's where the automated reasoning team comes in. Rather than exploring the state space, traveling from node to node along those links, trying to figure out how you escape the set of nodes that are expected, Automated reasoning formally defines the state space as a series of logical statements, axioms about how the system behaves. It constructs a logical model of your system programmatically driven by the actual configuration of the system, not by your understanding of its configuration. Then, using robust formal methods, you can prove things about the behavior of the system under that configuration. Rather than trying to visit every state in the state space, test every possible link in that finite state machine, you reason about the entirety of the state space, enabling you to make positive statements about your system, about the things that it might do, the things that it will do, and the things that it will never do, that is, the states that are actually unreachable. To tell you more about this and what we've done with it is someone who actually knows what she's talking about here, Neha. Hi, my name is Neha, and I work in the Automated Reasoning Group. So before I talk about the automated reasoning that we did at AWS, I want to take a little step back in history and talk about the early days of unautomated reasoning. This is Euclid. He, he was a mathematician in 300 BC. 
He proved the Pythagorean theorem that states that the square of the side opposite the right angle triangle is equal to the square of the sum of its sides. So how did Euclid approach this problem? Eric said he loves to fuzz, he loves fuzzing. So did Euclid try to fuzz all his triangles? Did he try to audit all the triangles he knew about? Did he do a review process to say, which of these triangles meet my threat model? I mean, hypothesis. Or did he try to study all the logs to see which of the triangles had been observed before? Spoiler alert, he did none of these. He used symbols in geometry to reason about many concrete values of a triangle. And the reasoning was not automated, but it did reason about a lot of triangles, all possible triangles, infinite of them. And it's not that we come in today or go to like a security conference like, hey, did you know they found a triangle that violates the Pythagorean theorem? And that's the value of having such a proof that says you have that assurance that you've covered all possible cases. So coming back to the modern world, computers aren't built out of triangles. Modern computing is just a bunch of zeros and one. Even the most complicated programs you can think of are essentially just zeros and ones in the end. The math of the zeros and ones is called Boolean logic. And a core problem in Boolean logic is checking satisfiability. So what does it mean to satisfy a Boolean formula? It means that you wanna find an assignment to the variables in the formula that make it true. And checking satisfiability is a known hard problem. In fact, it was the first problem to be proven NP-complete. And what this means is that there is another mathematical proof of its difficulty. And if, there, if you come up with a new problem and you wanna say, I wanna prove theoretically that this is a hard problem, what you would do is reduce it to the checking the satisfiability problem because that is a well understood hard problem and people are like, oh, okay, I get it, you have a hard problem. And for the past 30 years, because this is so interesting theoretically, scientists have really focused on trying to come up with efficient ways to solve this problem. And techniques such as conflict-driven clause learning, unit propagation, and nonlinear backtracking are some of the techniques that folks have come up with. So I wanna provide a little bit of intuition on why this problem is hard and how it has been solved efficiently. So the state space of the problem is is essentially determined by the variables on the left. If you have 20 variables, you have a state space of about a million. With 30 variables, you have a state space of over a billion. And what techniques like testing and fuzzing try to solve this problem is by working forwards from concrete values. They assign concrete values to these variables and then say, hey, can I get to the result I want? Which is saying that this formula is true. But what ends up happening is the state space is too large. You may get lucky, but if not, you can just continue exploring your state space. While what automated reasoning techniques do instead is work backwards. These techniques keep asking the question, how do I cause the result that I want? And it turns out that with some sophistication and clever algorithms, people have come up with efficient ways to solve this problem and created implementations of these and implemented it in things called SAT solvers. So now that we have a way of solving the problem efficiently, we do the most human thing ever and make the problem harder. We replace each Boolean variable, each zero or one, with a formula of its own. And these are called SMT formulas, where the variables, instead of just being Booleans, are integers, strings, lists. So just for a moment, if you think about it, where you had possibility of just a zero or one, each of this now have massive state space of its own. But we humans are a very resilient being, creatures. We create hard problems and then we try to solve these hard problems. And the tools that try to solve these SMT formulas are called satisfiability or SMT solvers. And SMT has been used in a variety of applications. Uh, hardware verification, how do you verify ALU design, aerospace applications. In my previous job, I worked on verification for collision avoidance systems, medical devices such as infusion pumps, and now in the cloud. And the key is, how did we pick the questions that we want to answer? Uh, security is 
is one of the very important tenants. It's, it's job zero for us. And reasoning about access control is, is an important pillar of security. And there's a couple of ways that we explored how we check access control related to security. One was with reachability of networks, and the other was analysis of access control policies. To reason about reachability in networks, we built a, a service called Tiros that answers questions about EC2 network con configurations. It does a static analysis of the networks, but it does not send any packets around. It's all symbolic. It, it creates logical formulas. It takes your network configurations and create logical formulas to understand what can reach where. And this allows us to even reason about networks that haven't been deployed. So let's look at a simple example. Here's an example for a three-tier web application. So we create a VPC, and then we want to put each of our tiers within its own subnets. We want to put a security group around the data server so that they can only talk to the app server, and then we want to pro pro uh, provide a security group around our application server so that they can only talk to the data servers and the web servers, and then we put an internet gateway so that our web servers can talk to the internet. So, okay, we have this. Are we done? Are we there yet? No, because we will continue to grow. Our network grows. We add another VPC and put a peering connection so that they can talk to each other. It'll grow some more because we will add applications from different teams, and suddenly we had an acquisition, so the network will continue to grow even more. The business is growing, it's scaling, so it keeps growing there. So in the same way that Eric asked the question on that Death Star diagram, if I were to ask you the same question here, I told you there is a misconfiguration in the network here. Could you go find it? How long would it take you to find it with some tools, through some scraping, manual review? few hours, days, a couple of weeks. And of course, the only thing constant in a network is change. So as soon as you found the thing, how do you know that something hasn't changed? Something in your VPCs, your ACLs, your subnets. And maybe by fixing something, you've introduced another mis misconfiguration. And most likely, before you're done, your network has grown and changed and evolved. And this is why we built a service called Turos. It allows you to answer the question, did I build the network I intended? And what are some of the types of questions you'd want to ask? So you want to say, who, who, are, who are all the people who can reach the component that holds cardholder data? So before we can ask the question, we need a network. So how do we actually get the shape of the network? What are we asking questions in? How do we know that there are no, uh, there are no servers hidden beneath any of the desks, under Joe or otherwise? And here's where... This is great being in a cloud. We have these describe calls, the APIs. It allows us to build a static representation of the network. We can, you know, we can get the instances, the ENIs, the route table, the VPC, the internet gateway. But what we have here is we have a complete picture of the network. We are assured that there is no instance underneath Joe's desk. And that is huge, because now you at least have your entire network. So how do we ask the question to this network? So as you can imagine, since we talked a lot about SMT solvers, the SMT solver is going to come into the picture here somehow. It's got to be in the story somewhere. So can we just give the network to the SMT solver and say, hey, which of the instances are reachable from the internet? The SMT solver is like, mm, I don't know. What's this? What are all these things you're asking me? And SMT Solver doesn't even know what the internet is because all it knows is math and logic. So how do you go from a network to something that an SMT Solver can understand? And that is the secret sauce. Because SMT Solvers don't understand VPCs or subnets or ciders, but, but we want to create a way. So we need to transform the world of VPCs, subnets, and ciders into the world of graphs, bit vectors, integers. This is the world and the language that an SMT solver can understand. And that's our secret sauce, encoding AWS into math. So that's the, if, if nothing, if like the one key takeaway you take from this talk is how do we make this happen is by encoding AWS into math. So how do we go from this network to a graph? So let's walk through this example. 
you have a couple of instances, we create nodes in a graph for these instances, and they are connected to ENIs. The ENIs communicate through the subnet. The subnet goes through the route table, the route table through the internet gateway, the internet gateway talks to the internet. It also goes back, the traffic flows back to the VPC, and the VPC is connected to the subnet. So if you take a moment, we've gone fairly effortlessly from what looks like a network to now what's starting to look like a graph. Let's look, what, what's along these edges? The edge along the, the nodes represent the conditions under which the traffic can flow from one node to another. And here we are adding what we call a constraint. This constraint says that the traffic can only flow between the VPC and subnet if the destination address is within a certain CIDR block range. And this is a symbolic representation. It represents all possible concrete packets that can flow between one node to another. But it doesn't actually send any concrete packets. A single symbolic packet represents many concrete packets. Let's look at another example of an edge between a subnet and an ENI. The traffic can flow between the subnet to an ENI when the destination address is of a specific value, here. And when, for the security group, it, there's an additional constraint that says that the source address has to be within a specific CIDR block range. So we can go through and encode all of these constraints along the edges. So now we've transformed something We've transformed our network into something that the SMT solver can understand. But we also now need to transform the question as well, because it's hard to believe, but the SMT solver doesn't understand just plain English sentences. So the, the question here is, can I SSH into instance A from the internet? And the key is like, well, what, what does it mean? The destination port has to be 22, the source port has to be greater than 1024, the protocol has to be TCP, and that there exists a path from the internet to instance A, and a path in that symbolic graph that we created. Now when we give this both the question and this graphified network to the SMT solver, it gives an answer. It says, yes, there is. And it also gives a concrete set of values to how it's possible. So then you could say, oh, okay, if the source address is this value and the destination address is this value, the destination port is this, this is how it can flow. So how did we build the secret sauce? What's the recipe? We hire experts in automated reasoning, put them in a room with EC2 documentation, and they transform EC2 documentation into a logic specification. They encode the VPCs, subnets, ciders into math. They're encoding AWS into math. And that's the secret sauce. So now that we have a secret sauce, we can say, give me any network, and with the secret sauce, it'll give me the answers to the questions such as which instances are reachable from the internet. If you want to know the details about how this happens, we have a peer-reviewed technical paper that describes all, all the nuances that go about this transformation, how we encode AWS into math. So a question you might have is like, do I have to be one of these nuts that Eric refers to to use Teros? And the answer is no. You can go today to Amazon Inspector, click on get, get Started, and you will see a set of rules, a set of network assessment rules that are Tiros based And you can just click on them. You can say, I want to run them weekly. You will get a set of findings. You can create automation around, hey, when anything that changes within my subnets, VPC, ciders, I can just rerun the Tiros evaluation and, and get a set of findings that, and you can bring remediations. So go, go try it out. Coming back to networks aren't special and we really focused on different aspects of access control as we were trying to apply automated reasoning uh, to cloud security. We also wanted to answer questions about how, how do we reason about access control policies. So in the same way uh, networks are different in the cloud, that there's no hidden desk. Access control before the cloud was complicated. 
in order to answer who has access to what, there was a variety of controls. You had file system permissions that were used to control and delegate access to data. You also had database credentials that you used to restrict to like a privileged set of users. And you had to know and think about all the different access control mechanisms that you, you used. And with, cloud, with the cloud, you had one a language. You had the Identity and Access Management System, IAM, to allow this one policy language allowed you to securely control access to different types of resources. So you have here a simple weather application. But with IAM, you can use the same language, the same policy language to govern access to your S3 buckets, your API gateway, your Lambda function, your DynamoDB. And even the delegation of permissions is just handled by the same permission model. There is no access control hidden under Jill's desk. Even here, everything is accessible via APIs. So here's an example of the policy language. The policy tells you who is granted or denied, what type of access, to what resources, under what conditions. So you have all the ingredients in the policy, but policies now are everywhere. It's great to have a unified permissions model, and you can attach policies and, and per, to, to govern permissions to your organizations, to your users, your roles, your S3 buckets, your KMS keys, your Lambda functions. But you also want to know the answer to this question. Did I grant the permissions that I intended? To look at the state space explosion here, just to kind of do a back of the envelope computation, what are the things you have to look at? Accounts, the number of users, resources, actions, IPs, VPCs, refers, because the policy document is small, right? Like, what's the state space of this? But you can have about 10 to the 12 AWS accounts, and this does not account for, you know, anonymous users, federated principles. Just keep doing some like, basic math. That's a really big number in terms of the state space. So, so we don't want to explicitly explore the state space. We want to be clever. We want to transform them into these logical formulas. And for that, we built this tool called Zelkova. What it took was a policy document and a question that you wanted to ask. And what are the policies? The policies can be an identity policy, a role trust policy, a S3 bucket policy. And what are some of the types of questions you can ask? Can user Alice launch EC2 instances? Can anyone outside account one, two, three assume this role? Can user Bob delete files from my bucket? And with the policy and the question, Zalkova would provide you yes or no answer. Great, we have a policy, you know, we're gonna say the same story again, an SMT solver. Do we, what, do, what do people think? Are we gonna have better luck this time? The SMT solver's back in that same quandary. It doesn't know what a bucket is, what a principle is, what an action is. We taught it about networking, but we didn't teach it anything about access control policies. So, but there is a way. In fact, transforming policies into math is actually very natural. Because it's, while it looks like a blob of JSON, there's a structure because it says, hey, my request will be allowed if it doesn't match either of the deny statements or matches one of the allow statements. And this is essentially a representation for first order logic because you have a conjunction over the denies and a disjunction over the allows. And you can just create a graph out of it. You can just say each node in this, in this graph represents a single statement in the policy. So I need to ensure that neither of it is deny, here the order doesn't matter, and it matches one of the allows. Now, and here, instead of a symbolic packet, what you have is a symbolic request. So when you're trying to do, when you're trying to get access, you can generate many possible, we saw almost infinite number of concrete requests, but in this graph, 
you, you have a very few number of symbolic requests. And that's how you can go, that's how you can reason about this entire large state space very efficiently. And there is more detail added into the graph. And the actual graph of the policy will have elements such as the principle, the action, and the resource, the elements in your statement. So these graphs can get pretty big as well because you can have many operators, many conditions, and it can keep growing. But now we know how to create the secret sauce. We take formal methods experts, we take the nerds, put them in a room. Now this time, instead of EC2 documentation, we put them in a room with IAM documentation. Again, we encode AWS into math. That's what we do. This time, it is access control policies that we turn into math, our secret sauce. But now that we have the secret sauce, we can ask questions such as, can user Bob delete files from my bucket? Give it to the SMT solver and get an answer. No. Again, if you want some details about how each of these transformations for each of the policy languages are done, you can go and read, read on this paper. Do, I, do, you, do you need to be an expert again? Anybody want to take a guess? No. Oh, perfect. This is great. This, I didn't even have to answer it. You can go to AWS Config Manage Rule, search for Zalkova. You'll get a bunch of rules powered by it you have, uh, that can allow you to check different properties. The, in the S3 console, there is a public badge that's driven by Zalkova. It provides you visibility into whether your buckets are public or not. Um, a lot of feedback after this was like, I want to ensure that this never happens. Can you give me something preventative? Pre give me a guardrail that says my buckets can never be public. So we partnered with Amazon uh, S3 last year again to uh, bring block public access. And we want everybody, everybody, except the people who are doing web-based assets to turn on block public access uh, that ensures that the buckets can never be public. So one thing after, Zelkov was great at answering a yes or a no question, and the feedback we heard from you is, this is great, but often I don't know what to look for or what questions to ask. So can you instead just tell me who has access to what, and then I can decide if this sharing is intentional? So how do we answer the question who has access to what? I can go about and say, hey, for every AWS account I know of, I can ask a question, do they have access to your resource? But now I have to do it for every VPC, every IP address. That's a lot of questions. How, but how do, we build, how do we build this question set? And this is where AWS really helps us out. It's secure by default. No external entity has access to your resource unless you explicitly specify it in your policy. So we're like, we're gonna leverage this fact. We're gonna get clever and gonna use this fact to our advantage. So who are the who's in the policy? It's these principles and the VPCs that you've specified in your policy. What is the action? These are just syntactic things. We can look at and write it down, this, who are, uh, the actions are. And what are the resources that we have here? And if you look at it, we've extracted parts that will make up our question from the policy itself. Now, let's, let's not even think about the policy, because what we want is to think about the questions we want to ask the policy. And then we take these elements, and then they try to come up with a set of questions. How do we combine these constructs to come up with a set of questions? Let's just try to see, can we, can we cover all the combinations? What are the types of questions we'd ask? Say, hey, does one, two, three have star access to my bucket? Does star have get object access to my bucket? Does star have star access to my bucket? Does one, two, three with VPC ABC have get object access to my bucket? And if you look closely, these are all elements that we've extracted from the policy. And these are the questions we can give to Zalkova to say, which of these is true? It says, oh, only one is true. But the key here is you did not have to come up with the question. And that is what we've built, is how can we take the answer and synthesize into a simple finding? And the finding is not something that's just a regurgitation or a summary of your policy. It tells you 
who outside your account has access to resources in your account. And if you look at the elements in the finding, they come from different parts of the policy. They don't just come from a single statement. And here it says, essentially, you have get object access if you come from VPC ABC. And parts of it are from the allow statement, but parts of it are from the deny statement. So to answer the question, who has access to what, we recently launched IAM Access Analyzer. What it does is it takes your policy, dissects it, creates a bunch of questions based on the entities that you've specified in your policy. And now you have a ton of questions. It gives it to Zalkova, to do, and then Zalkova is great at answering yes or no questions. So what you have is a state space generator on top of Zalkova. It, it gives you all the possible questions that you want to ask. It generates it. Access Analyzer generates those questions and Zalkova answers each of them. It allows us to explore the state space of who has access to your resources. So you may say, well, aren't you now just doing the hard problem because now that's gonna be large too. That's a lot of questions still, even if you just look at what's in the policy. And the insight here is that we do it the way we would play 20 questions. If you play 20 questions, you don't start with the most specific question. You start with a high level question. Does star have star access? And then as you keep going in 20 questions, you then start asking a little more specific question. And then you keep asking more specific questions as you go on. So if you look at it, if we map it to the example here, what does it mean? If we ask, if Access Analyzer says, does star have star access? Which is essentially saying, is my resource public? Then we don't have to ask any more questions. It doesn't matter then now that user Bob has read access uh, from VPC ABC, because there's, it's subsumed. If the answer is no, then we move to the next slightly more specific question that says, does principle one, two, three have star access? When the answer is yes, we don't ask any more questions below it because they're all more specific. But we do move to the next question. Does VPC have star access? Nope. Does star have get object access? Nope. So we finally come to the last question. Does VPC ABC have get object access? So even in the simple example, there were eight possible questions but we only asked five questions to the solver, and out of which only two came back as yes. And so we would have a two findings. There are two ways that somebody can have access to your resource. And that's what allows us to very efficiently generate findings for large, uh, many resources, many, many policies. So how do you use it? You can go today, to the IAM console. On the left nav, you'll see access reports with access analyzer. You can go, you can say, create analyzer. It's one click. With one click, you can say, create an analyzer. What it will do is scan all the policies attached to your S3 buckets, KMS keys, Lambda functions, SQS queues, IAM roles, and do it automatically and generate a set of findings. A finding is who outside your account has access under what condition. And you can click on the finding to see more details. What, what's the act, what are the actions that is granted? If, if the finding is intentional, because not all cross-account sharing is uh, unintended, if, the, if it is intended, you can archive it. You can click archive. If it is not, you can go to the respective service console to edit and update the policy. This change will be automatically detected and the evaluation will be rerun. And if it is, the finding will be re resolved. But if you want to just have a quick thing, there is a rescan button. You don't want to wait for the change trigger evaluation to flow through. You can just click rescan immediately. In a, in a workflow similar to guard duty, if you want to say, hey, I want to create filters for automatic archive, archiving because I may have sharing from 
my IP addresses from my data center or the read access from my security audit role, I want to create those filters. So you can create those. So you can go turn it on today. It's available at no, uh, no charge. And you can analyze all your policies. So at AWS, one primary measure of our success is how our customers feel in this experience. And before I hand back to Eric, I want to leave you with how automated reasoning is impacting our uh, customers, how they're benefiting from it. Here's one example where Bridgewater Associates is talking about their use of Tiros and Zalkova and how they've used to verify the security controls are working as expected. Eric? Thank you. So it's awesome, right? Like we, we've solved it. We've exhausted the state space. We're symbolically reasoning about access control. Yet I'm still wearing an Amazon shirt, and the company paid for me to come out here. Why am I still employed? Well, automated reasoning is expensive. Uh, th there's a reason that we haven't solved all of the world's problems using automated reasoning. We, we have a very special situation here at AWS where we have these problems like network access and policy access that are completely captured in APIs and that are amenable to transformation into logical statements. Um, and we had to hire a bunch of people. And those people had to spend a whole lot of time. Neha alighted a whole bunch of, okay, we've got a tool working, and it runs on all the policies I've ever seen, and then you feed it another policy that has another combination of statements, bug reports, fixes, performance enhancements. Building these tools was resource intensive. Math has no common sense. It, it can't tell you if the thing that you're doing is the right thing to do. It can just tell you that it's the thing that you're doing. Uh, we just went through Thanksgiving here in the United States. There's the whole Black Friday, Cyber Monday thing. If you're going to make a change to your e-commerce site during one of those two days, you would better have a bunch of high judgment humans looking at that change. And it may be that there is some security risk there, but the business risk outweighs the security risk. We have no mathematical formula for that. You need people that have business context and human judgment to chime in there. And finally, I love this quote. The APIs that model our network are complete, but the model is not your entire application. And so here, these are the, the logos for Spectre and Meltdown. I gave a talk on these two this Monday. We thought that we were doing things right, and then a bunch of very clever researchers stacked together the blocks that we'd all been playing with for years, and a combination of speculative execution and cache timing allowed them to extract data from places that they shouldn't have been able to reach. And that changed our model for how we do computation. This was a great process. The researchers worked with industry. I really thank them for their work. This was not a bad thing. I would rather learn about this and be able to respond to it than having it show up on the news one day and scramble. But it fundamentally changed how we think. It showed us that our model of multi-tenant computing was flawed and needed to be adjusted. And so, and this is going to continue to happen to us. All of our models are going to be flawed in some way, but we've found that the models we have for access control are really useful. And so getting back to those nut jobs that showed up spouting off about how their math can solve all the world's problems, they weren't completely right, but they weren't completely wrong. And so automated reasoning is not the entire answer, but it's an amazing technique that I'm really glad that we've invested in. Not only have we been able to prove things about our code and our services to maintain invariants that are important to our customers, but we've also been able to launch services and features that put this technological wizardry in the hands of novice and expert customers alike. So I'm sold. I'd like to thank you for sticking with us this late into Thursday afternoon. We appreciate your time. And uh, every single session has this slide in it. But please do complete the survey. We value your feedback. We'd like to know where we hit the mark and where we missed. And again, thank you. <laughs>